Yeah, exactly. I think that's really important. And I try, I try and be quite, um, I don't know, I like to bow to the narrator's kind of experience as well, because especially because I don't really listen to much audio fiction. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I've spoken to a few people, I've spoken to a lot of people <laughs> about audiobooks, and something that comes up a bunch is that in the end, the narrator has a lot of experience, mm. and if they're saying, you know, something, obviously you get the final call, you're the author, but give it a serious listen. Don't think that they're just, you know, trying to take an easy route or something. They they, they know what they're doing, and if you've chosen someone who, you've, you know, who is experienced and has done a lot of books, they, you know, they do have a bit of knowledge. They know what's going on, so... Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I really only tend to uh, feedback on, on proper nouns, you know, like English place names, like, you know, Southwark, which, you know, Southwark, you know, is actually ah, yeah, Southwark. Okay. You know, that's really the only thing I generally come back on. Um, or point of view changes where there's not enough breath space or, you know, pausing between that really, you know, very little. And, um, but you know, every, you should, everyone listening should know you do have to listen to the whole book. So, um, it's yes. actually quite, it's quite disturbing as an author. I've just, um, I've just finished this weekend listening to Delirium, which is the second in my London psychic series. And I'd forgotten the book. Um, <laughs> and it was weird listening to it because you're like, Oh my goodness. How, how long ago did, did you I write, write it? That? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. How long ago did you write it? Oh, not that long ago. It launched in like August. But I, <laughs> I, I, like, <laughs> so many twists and turns. Well, no, it's just that I'm in. I'm writing the other series again now, so yeah. I've kind of switched entirely out of that character. Those characters, and it's so weird. It's so weird listening. But I really like the process, and I appreciate it as a kind of artistic collaboration, which is another reason I like. Um, doing the 50-50 royalty split you know I really feel like the narrator is probably more bought into the project yeah I, I would I would agree it is they are a partner they're, they've got an equal split in the success of this book mm. and I think that is I think that's valuable I think it's definitely how I prefer working mm. I'm just like I have an interest in this I know you know whether if this book does well that's good for me and but obviously you know if I put out a bad book then you know other people when I bid for projects in the in the in the future they're going to see like oh, this book wasn't very good and might not go for me so obviously I have an economic incentive there mm. but splitting the project is is heavily incentivizing a narrator mm. I have I mean I actually it's funny though now we're talking about this do you narrate fiction at all do you just do non-fiction I've done a couple I, I generally prefer non-fiction mm. I think it seems to go down well in America. Mm. Uh, I think, as I hear from my podcast, people like a British accent. And so I think my books do pretty well in the US. And I, I, I think British people sound smart to Americans. I'm not saying I'm smart, um, but I think but they think sound I weird. sound smart. So <laughs> like reading these books and people are like, oh, it's, 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 it sounds like the person reading is intelligent. And I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good point. And, and it's funny because I have actually considered you know, recording other people's audiobooks too, like yeah. doing narration like you do. It's something that is on my kind of list of what I'm interested in. Um, you know, in terms of the fact as an entrepreneur like yourself, I'm not, I, I'm, I want to do uh, co, co-working or what do we call it? Co-writing or whatever. But I feel like that is less likely than me doing a co-narration um, is that is that a kind of strange thing? Have you? I mean, I guess this is coming from nowhere. This question, but have you? Have, have you do you just apply for books on on ACX as a narrator? It's, compared to, I mean, when I first started out of this, I literally googled how do I make money with my voice, and then so I was like recording things on like a fifteen dollar microphone and sending them off to like agents and stuff. And one guy took me on and so I did a I did some books like this way and I get a really small amount of money and but it you know, it was a totally different world and this was maybe two thousand nine, so mm. just five years ago. And now it's like you just go onto ACX, you can look for sign up for an eraser profile, look for a book and download the audition script and be like, here you go. Do you want to pay me? And it's it's just so easy and amazing. It's just a 
from the narrator perspective, when this launched in the UK, I was like, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm like, very doing excited. fist movements right now. <laughs> No, do you know what? I am going to seriously think about that for next year because it would satisfy my kind of desire to do co stuff, um, with royalty split work, which I like because I like the scalable model. Um, and also, like you, you know, I, I think when you first start doing audio, like when you first start podcasting, you hate your voice, right? You hate it. <laughs> Totally. Do you have that thing where now when you speak into the microphone or listen to your voice, like when you speak, it sounds the same? Yeah, maybe that's what happened. It, it Over time, you get so used to it and it doesn't bother you. And, and now I, I, I really hated my voice. And I thought I sounded like a child, like a kind of stupid child. And <laughs> <laughs> Everyone does. I... I, many people had to tell me that my voice was nice until I googled how do you make money with your voice and I was like really really uh-huh mm -hmm. who's gonna who's gonna listen to me well but I get the same as you people email me all the time and say on Twitter how much they like my voice so yeah. I don't know it's definitely anyway here you go you heard it here first people I may well be narrating books in the new year <laughs> It's, it's so easy to get started. Mm. I mean, just if you're interested in, and I think also, I mean, you have a podcast and stuff, so you must be like into getting your voice in front of a crowd exactly. and being listened to. It's, it's kind of narcissistic, but it's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of cool. I mean, I definitely dig it. And it's like, ah, so many thousand people listen to me. It's like, hmm, that I is like quite that. nice. Yeah, no, and it's definitely very di a very different kind of way of doing things, but I do like it. And we're so lucky in this digital world now. You know, you're in, in Prague, I'm in London, and we sell. Most people listening will be in America and, you know, wherever they are. And it's very exciting. There really is no limit to what we can do, um, which is cool. It's exceptionally cool. It is. We're so lucky. Um, okay, so I, what else did I want to ask? Oh, any... Uh, well, people may ask about technical equipment. I guess that's probably best to be in the book, isn't it? Because, you you know, there's no point in listing off a whole load of stuff. Or is it really just the mic in your little sheet there? Uh, honestly, three pieces of... A, two pieces of equipment. Microphone, pop filter. Microphone, $100 pop filter. You can make it with a pair of tights and a coat hanger. But seriously, just go onto Amazon and spend the $10. $10. $10. <laughs> um, I have these blankets up because I am in an echoey kitchen mm. um, where I work. <laughs> Very high tech. And uh, but that's it. And you can use the software Audacity, which is free. Um, a lot of this, this big debate going on about whether you need, it's kind of like a, a, there's the USB microphone and then there's kind of the more, um, what people in a studio would use, which is like XLR, which is like a much more, you know, it's where the guy has the knobs on the board and you have to have, it's, it's much more complicated. I'm like, I think my show sounds good. I think my people tell me my audiobooks sound fine. I'm like, I'll stick with USB. It's just easy. Mm. Um, so yeah, but there's a, there's a debate going on. I outlined that in the book about which ones you want to go for the pros and cons. And I do give it a, an equal thing, I, I hope. Yeah, but I do, you know, I think this is the other thing. I mean, when I started my podcast, I know that's different, but I just, I actually, my very first interview, I phoned somebody up on a phone and put it on speakerphone and held a recorder. I remember this story, <laughs> yeah. So, and that was my first podcast. And, you know, I, maybe not with, with audio books, but basically you can do audio stuff with more basic equipment and, you know, and video stuff like our video, you know, I'm just using my webcam. It's not a big deal. And I think, technology has changed so much hasn't it and got so much better that you don't need to spend that much money to get high quality stuff i do agree i think you will need to spend a minimum amount of money because simply because you need to meet those acx mm. submission requirements and they won't accept stuff that doesn't meet them so low quality stuff might not make it through although by some of the books i've listened to uh <laughs> at least maybe they used to be a bit more slack on what they let through and I might have recorded a book with a $15 microphone back at the start. <laughs> um, I'll just leave that as a might. Uh, <laughs> but it, yeah, like you say, it is it is much easier than it once was. Mm. Right, so we have an audiobook. How do we market it? <laughs> right. Um, okay, so as we mentioned, there's no price control. So all of those wonderful indie 99 cents free runs, uh, forget them because you can't do it. And mm. the, 
I'm probably going to do my book a disservice here, but the the marketing section is short because there are there is there is little you can do. However, mm. there are a few things. Now, when you get your book done, you and it's and it's finished, and ACX have said, "Yeah, it's good to go. It's up on the store." You can you get 25 codes, which you which basically allow you to give away the book. So someone can go to Audible and plug in this code, and they can download a free copy. You must use these for reviews. Hmm. Um, the, uh, it seems the Audible algorithm and like how books rank is nowhere near as developed as Amazon's, and the whole the whole site is 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 less developed. There's you know there's there's no real way to track, you know, ranks and see who's selling better other than kind of clicking through mm. and seeing. So it's like, you want to see like what the 30th best selling book is or where this book sells. You have to click through all of the things. Um, anyway, I'm getting distracted. Uh, but so you take these codes and you can send them off and the reviews may also, they, they make your book look, uh, you know, if there's five star reviews, it's going to sell more, but also it, it apparently, it makes the book appear higher in rankings. So if you get a lot of early reviews early on, that's going to push the book up and more people are going to see it and more people are going to buy it, which will lead to more reviews. Getting 25 people to listen to an audiobook and review it is uh, is harder than you think. It's I really know people, yeah. yeah. So you must know about these codes and yeah. you send them out and you're like, Yay, two reviews. Yeah. Um, so my advice would be hassle people because there are few marketing opportunities that you must make the most of this one. If you have a big audience like you do as well, you can go back and say, hey, ACX, how about 25 more codes? And if you use mm-hmm. those, you can say, hey, ACX, how about 25 more codes? And they pretty much always oblige as of now. They might stop doing that because it just seems like they just give them away willy-nilly. Um but yeah, do, so you, I think they're very generous with those at the moment, as you say. They they are we are at a point where they're trying to grow the platform. So so if you yeah. give someone a free code, they may like it so much they might join as well. Oh, that's a good point. Mm. Yeah, um, aggressive expansion. So yeah, either way, they give these codes away, and you you should use as many as you can. Um, I guess it's the same. I just gave away my book as ARC copies. I sent it out. I said on my podcast, if you email me before the book goes live, I will send you a copy for free. And I would just do the same thing for an audiobook. Just mm. even more, if you don't give your eBooks away, see, just try and get rid of those audiobooks and exchange them for reviews and kind of make it clear, you know, like an audiobook is a $15 item. So giving that away is a bigger deal. So kind of say to people, you know, audiobooks are expensive. It's more than just, I'm giving you my three, $4 book. Mm. I'm giving you something that's, you know, that I've paid for. I've paid, I mean, you pay for a book and editing and stuff, but you've mm. actively spent thousands of dollars or you you know, you've given away half of your rights for seven years yeah, to too. create this product. So come on guys, you know, we, we I'm should, passionate uh, about this. Give we, me a review. <laughs> we should interrupt this uh, broadcast mm. to say that if you would like a free copy of any of my fiction, you can email me, <laughs> Joanna at thecreativepen.com, and you can email Simon for uh, anything you like. <laughs> <laughs> you can? My email inbox. <laughs> no, no, presumably, seriously, they, yeah. presumably there'll be an audio version of audiobooks for indies. In fact, I'm planning on, I, I mentioned that thing about meeting the ACX submission requirements. I'm kind of, I've, I'm probably going to commit myself to something big here, like you're committing yourself to doing audiobooks next year and erasing them. I'm going to kind of document the process. So I'll be getting my webcam out and kind of saying like, here's me and I'm setting it up and I'm plugging in the microphone and I'm opening the program and just kind of a real walkthrough so people can do that. But yes, uh, 2015, there will be an audiobook version. Mm. I'm going to let the... Uh, the ebook sit for a few months before doing prints and audio. Yeah, which is which is another good point. As in, yeah, reading it, you want to make sure it's it's kind of perfect. <laughs> yeah, I should mention. Sorry about promotions. There was something I did mm. want to mention, and that's uh, kind of using raffle copter and stuff to oh. give away copies because you do have these codes, and if you can you know, team up with other authors. One of the few seemingly effective promotions I've seen is Mm. where, you know, you find a few other authors who have recently put out audiobooks and still have these codes and say, let's get together and give away, you know, a 10 pack of our audiobooks to a lucky winner. And that's also got the benefit of you can, you know, also say, hey, and I'd like your email address and build up your mailing list and which is good for your next audiobook and Mm. all of that stuff. Um, Again, it's kind of 
scraping here because there's no you're right I actually I'm just checking I did write a blog post on marketing for ACX and um, mm. there were a couple of things I do one is you must have a web page which is audio so I've got jfpen.com forward slash audio which has got all the links but also it's got SoundCloud um, audio clips oh yes and you can do 15 minutes off platform exactly so you can use that percentage to um to basically point at the audio and soundcloud if people don't know is really easy to share and you know you just click it and it'll play within twitter or within facebook and and you can also have a hyperlink within soundcloud to the audio book so yeah. That's a, and also uh, another sneaky income thing. If you use Amazon affiliates, you can link to just the Amazon page where the, you get the audio link to, and you know you get an affiliate payment. And not to mention, Audible have a way more favorable affiliate program mm -hmm. than Amazon. Um, for I'm not sure what it is these days because they did cut it down a while ago, but I believe it's still um, ten dollars per free trial sign up so if you have an audience who haven't been into audio before make sure you sign up for the audible affiliate program because if you send someone across and they buy your book you'll make your you know your four or five or i guess more if you haven't done the if you've paid for the production up front mm -hmm. but you'll also get a ten dollar um, affiliate commission is that different to the bounty yes so you can do both so what explain the bounty the bounty is so when someone when a new Audible customer buys one of your books, you get it. Is it $25 or I think they changed it to 50 Yeah, I think it's 40 or 50 I've had only I've yeah, had okay. a few of them, not too many, but, you know. I think it was 25 and then when they cut the royalty rate from 50% down to 40 they upped the... Um, yeah, the, the bounty, bounty payment, the bonus when someone buys, when your book is one of the first books purchased, mm -hmm. they up that to $50, I think. So that's pretty great. Mm. Um, oh, I see what you mean. So, for example, so the bounty, they have to buy your book first. If they buy your book first and join, you get a bounty. But if they buy anyone else's book, you'll get an affiliate payment. Yeah. Yes. Um, Basically. I, <laughs> I'd, need to check, I'd need to check my book for this. <laughs> Yeah, the details of making income online, um, you know, but essentially there is a reason we point to this stuff from our websites. And if you put extra little codes in, you can get more money. Um, and as you say, it builds up over time. I mean, you know, this time last year I was making like zero from audiobooks and I just got like 500 quid last month. I was super thrilled. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and as we said at the top of the show, it is just, you know, unlock the potential of your book. Yes, because unlock it. There can, can be money just sitting there and, and waiting. Yeah, the other thing on marketing just um, is promoting where audio is consumed. So podcasts being an obvious one. I mean, right now there are not that many genre fiction podcasts. It's actually easier to advertise audio when you do non-fiction, I think, because you, you can get a lot of podcast interviews and you can say, my book is available in ebook, print and audio book. That's yeah. kind of a, a, just a basic thing now, I think. You should be saying that everywhere. Yeah, I think as audio, audio is, you know, there's a big push and it's becoming a more a bigger thing. So print, you know, digital print and audio. Yeah, yeah. Just, just say that. Um, okay, so, oh, we come, you know, you go long on your interview, so I'm, I'll, go I'm allowed to go. I've just got to check. I just, we can go a little bit long, can't we? Is that all right? Always. Yeah, okay. Um, because you've been podcasting a while, um, just tell us, like, why did you start a podcast um, and do you recommend it for other authors? It depends what you want to get out of it. Mm. Um, I think I started it and it became a success kind of by accident. I started it because I thought the people who I was narrating books for were cool and I wanted to talk to more people like that. And one thing led to another and a year later, here we are, or you know, nearly 18 months later, here we are. I think if there's this big, and um, people make it the mistake with blogging and they make the mistake with podcasting or whatever, it's like, if you are writing about writing and you're writing fiction, I think you'll agree with me, people, you know, that's not attracting your fiction audience. And I think you've seen this recently with JF Penn and the creative Penn and they're, they're separate entities. Mm. So if you're starting a podcast about writing, either write about writing or start a podcast and as you said you know there are genre podcasts popping up there are there's not that many of them there's not many 
But I think if you're looking to sell books through your podcast, I don't know if that's effective. It's not something I've done, but it's going to be more effective than having a writing podcast. However, there are huge other benefits. Like two years ago, I would be listening to, not even two years ago, even less than that. I'd be listening to your podcast and here I am talking to you on yours. I've had you on mine once and again, and we've met up twice. And I, this is amazing. It's like, and this is just one example of the people you meet and the connections you make through being a podcaster. And I, I think, I can't remember which show I heard it on, but there was a guy and he was interviewing people and he was like, yeah, I started the podcast because I wanted to, you know, there's no way I'd ever, ever be able to get like an hour of consulting chat exactly. from someone. Yeah. And it's like, so I started a podcast. I have just framed it as an interview. <laughs> That, then, well, I, I've said that before. That's why I started a podcast. Because, maybe it was your show then that yeah, I had this you can't on. Pay, you can't pay most of these people for it. <laughs> no. Because they're like, my, consulting, if I was doing it, it'd be, you know, there is no price I could charge that people would pay for this. Oh, but a podcast interview, I could do that. Yeah, exactly. So it's, these, not, it's seen as marketing. Yeah, it is. And, and it is. And I think, you know... Um, me coming on your show, you're coming on mine. We both have things that other, each other's audiences is, is going to dig. And that's great. And I think it is marketing, but it's also, you know, for the person who's hosting the show or even in this situation, you know, it's, it's a cool opportunity to get access to information and people who you wouldn't normally be able to. Mm. And so I think, yeah, if you, if you're thinking about starting a podcast, you don't need equipment. You don't, you need like $10 a month for podcast hosting and a WordPress website, which is what 10 bucks a month as well. And you're good to go. Mm. I mean, it's, and it's, I think, yeah, I think uh, for me, I think because there's a, there's a slightly higher barrier to entry with, with audio. If someone has generally, if they've done 10 episodes and I can see evidence of 10 episodes, I feel like that person is doing a good job. Um, so I pretty much say yes to any show that has over 10 episodes because, you know, well, I think they're serious. Whereas now I will not do a guest post, like a text, you know, an article huh. because it's so much effort. Whereas going on an interview is not that much effort, really. And I also think like, how long would the guest post for this interview be? Not that yeah. what I'm saying has any value whatsoever, but <laughs> I mean, just I feel if someone was to write this up, I don't know if you have transcripts. I, it's well, not... it would be about 15 to 20 pages. How long is that going to take to write as a guest post or even yeah. just the information? Yeah. But just us chatting, there is so much information and I'm sure there are people out there on their jogs. So it, it's more efficient to create. Mm. And then it's more efficient to consume because you're out jogging and mm. I'm sure there are people listening to us speak really fast because they're on two speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do and understand that. But I know there are people ironing. I get a lot of people say they're ironing when they listen. Yeah. Yeah. Driving, <laughs> ironing, cooking. At I hear gym. it all. <laughs> yeah, the gym. For sure. <laughs> but no, I agree with you. For me, it's about relationship building and the relationships that I've built through the podcast. Because, you know, we get to hang out for an hour as well. And I'll just I'll just mention Stephen Pressfield, having Stephen Pressfield on my show. I That was the moment I just thought, right now I can give up because it's like the pinnacle. So now I'm aiming for Stephen King. So I'm starting to put this out there now. I'm, I want Stephen King on my podcast. So if anyone knows Stephen... Uh, point him in my direction. <laughs> All right. Well, what's the date now? It's it's late 2014. I'm looking yeah, forward to this. It's November 2014, and I basically will not consider giving up my podcast again up until that point. Then I will revisit the whole idea because it Good. does take a long time. We should say this. It, I mean, um, you have to, uh, you know, research. I know you do very good research um, uh, on your <laughs> guests, and I do as well. And then you do the interview and then you have to edit it and then you do the bit of technical stuff. So how long does an interview, how long does an episode take you generally? I am super fussy. So on, I'm, I'll like do an hour and hour plus of research on the person mm -hmm. plus maybe 20 minutes in emails back and forth to set things up and get a bit of background. Then an hour and 15 to an hour and a half for an hour of recording, then 15 minutes of just chit chat afterwards, depending on if the person wants to hang out and talk. Because most people do, you just mm. talk to the person for an hour and you get off the air and you're like, oh, that was fun. What do you think about this? I feel like, you know, it's rather than just thanks, bye. Yeah, yeah. Um, so an hour and 15, an hour and 30 there. Um, then afterwards, the work begins. Mm. Um, 
I record everything separately. I process all the tracks separately and run like different things through them so they sound nice. Then I mix them together and then I listen and I go through and I cut out bits and that I don't, you know, that are kind of dragging on or I remove long silences if people cough or put the dog out, that kind of stuff. I cut that all out. So maybe two hours in post-production, including writing the show notes, because I kind of do that at the same time. Mm. And then I have my VA take that and kind of mix in the intro and outro and put it up onto Hipcast, which is my host, and put the blog out on WordPress. So my time is, my time spend is probably three hours three and a bit hours and then my VA probably spends an hour and a bit on that as well yeah I was gonna say I'm probably three to four hours per show as well yeah I mean it it really does add up you think it's just two people having a chat yeah no yeah (laughs) no I mean you do you have to have a reason like you say so I would urge people to consider what is the end result that you're looking for um from from a podcast um now I do quickly want to ask you um because audio is one kind of multimedia but you're a bit of a YouTube star as well a bit of a bit of a pro on the video too um (laughs) and audio quality is obviously critical for video and there will be people who are watching this on my YouTube channel which I just haven't optimized at all so I um I literally just put the videos up there and don't really do much about it um you know what can authors do with video and what you know how how can one have a good YouTube channel (laughs) big question but the cool thing is and I think authors will dig this is you know that whole SEO and optimization stuff is really 20 to 30 percent of the game on YouTube it's not like I don't know, with blogs and keywords and thinking about this and what are people going to be searching for? I need to put that like three times in my show notes and in the header, which I regularly don't bother with anyway. <laughs> but um, on YouTube, the cool thing is, like you say, you put out the, the content and the content is really so important. And as well as making good content that people are going to like and comment on and even dislike, um, as long as people are engaged, that's what really matters. Um, but having good content, number one is regularity. Mm. I would, if you want to kind of build up a following, you need to look at what people are doing similar to you and then do it more often and do it as good or better. And once you've kind of optimized that, it's not that hard. There are a few things you need to do each time, like um, get a good introduction, get a good, you know, um, once you've got your kind of setup and you're comfortable in front of the camera and comfortable in front of the, the microphone or whatever you're doing, it becomes very easy to kind of roll through it. And if your setup is more professional than someone else's, then your video will probably be better. Mm. And then also some other things around that, like coming up with good titles and thumbnails is super important. Like you do this well. You have the faces of all the people you interview in the thumbnail and the text next to it. And that is super, don't, you know, I I can't remember when they allowed it, but YouTube started allowing you to do custom thumbnails. Don't waste that opportunity. It is gold. Yeah. Like if you've got your video up there, take the time to go into like paint even or Photoshop if you have it or whatever your editing program is and make a thumbnail that looks cool, big text, someone's face <laughs> and people just like that. Um, yeah. And also a good and, and like a, a title, mm. like come up with a catchy title. And while I hate those clickbait titles, People really forgive you if your video is awesome. Yeah. So it's like if they clicked on it for like the eight reasons that X, Y, Z, but then there are eight good reasons, that's cool. <laughs> if there are eight crap reasons, then that's not cool. And people will dislike it and they'll mm. and the YouTube comments, I don't really get I don't down even it. Look at it. <laughs> but they're don't now want to. they're now Google Plus, aren't they? So As things well, have yeah. changed, yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, just I mean the overwhelming thing is regularity of content if you can do it more than once a week that's that's really great and mm. yeah that that's a major advantage because most people don't and getting a good setup and once you kind of have made one professional video it's it's easier to kind of see the process and continue mm. to create professional videos mm. and, and i kind of double up with the podcast i record the video i edit the video and then i just turn the video into the mp3 so i it doesn't take me double the time to do video and audio just is once no there's an amazing tool that takes your mp3s and puts them on youtube do you use it what's it called 
Well, no, or are I you put, just do... I put the MP4. Ah, of course. Juice. Sorry, that went to place it because you have the, the video as well. Um, I was taking all of my podcasts, just the raw MP3, and there was a tool that took my podcast feed hmm. and turned it into a YouTube video. Yeah. But I wasn't really convinced about that, so I stopped doing it. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the thing. And, it, you know, I've really used it as a very passive channel. But, you know, I seem to have, well, and I know it's not a big deal on YouTube, but I've got like 4,000 subscribers on YouTube or something. Which... It's kind of, that's really a lot of subscribers. Don't discount that. Yeah. And you can reach them. People, you know, subscribers to like a YouTube channel are not like likes to a Facebook page because mm. you can message all of your subscribers. But this is something that I think authors should be doing again it helps you stand out uh, there are so few I mean there are lots more people doing podcasts than there were when I started it's like I, I tend to be a little bit early on these things you know my podcast started in 2009 when podcasting was not trendy self-publishing was no. not trendy <laughs> whereas I'm always like oh that seems cool people are doing that I'll just copy them <laughs> yeah but see what what you you've benefited from not having to go through the really slow up curve that mine has gone through which you know I heard ridiculous. a podcast in 2009 sorry <laughs> yeah exactly and I was way too early on that but and again with YouTube I'd started at similar time and the early videos are shocking but I do think that doing more video because Google of course has the Google Glass voice recognition stuff as well now right so and Google owning YouTube do you think that there will be more voice recognition technology used with YouTube uh, in what context well in that I have you know hundreds of hours worth of interviews on my YouTube channel that don't have captions but if the automatic captioning stuff worked then i would get that seo benefit of voice oh yeah um because youtube will caption all your stuff and i was experimenting with transcripts for the mm. this is in fact the reason i uploaded it into youtube in the first place mm. was to take advantage of their awesome captioning mm. and then i would download the captions and have my va turn them into transcripts but it was really messy. It was it was not a good idea. But I think that will get better. And then because yeah, you mentioned you know the the SEO there, and because of video, Google can't look through that mm. and then find the keywords that you want, and so you can't rank for them as easily as you would like a blog post. But um, yeah, so take advantage uh, until that really sorts itself out, and I think it will become. I mean, it's a technology that will advance and it will become yeah. awesome at some point. Yeah, and we'll just. Get it right. Well, but until... Is, sorry. Well, I was going to say, I think Google Glass is the beginning of the start because Google Glass is all voice recognition. Yeah. So they're and they, really they starting to they gather that it. information and yeah. they build their algorithms and then... Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. This is what I'm counting on. And look, the other thing is, have you heard this Skype uh, translate? Oh, I saw the, the presentation. That was so cool. Amazing. If people yeah. don't know, like I, Simon could be talking in Czech. And I could be hearing him. It's the in English. It's like the um, the Star Trek voice thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, the communicator. Yeah, the communicator. So cool. Not quite as slick, but really, but, you can you can see how this is the path to yes instantaneous translation through a computer. And it's it, amazing. If you should, <laughs> I hate it when people say this on my show. I don't hate it. I like it. But they're like, and you should link up to that in the show notes. <laughs> I will link up to that in the show notes. It's so worth watching. It is, but the thing is, I guess what I want to say to people is what we've talked about today. I mean, we're in the baby, baby year. We're in year one of ACX oh, in the UK. Sorry. We're in baby steps audio. We're in baby steps video. I mean, seriously, we're, I mean, with self-publishing, we're only toddlers. We've been doing it a couple of years and it's so exciting what's, what's coming. You know, it really is. I, I think about this and people are like, oh, you know, the self-publishing, the gold rush is over. Yeah. So I'm like, are you kidding me? This is the future of books. Books. It's like they've been around forever. So obviously, we're biased. But yes, we really, are biased. you see it going another way? No. And, and but, you know, and, and in terms of our, you know, coming back to that business stuff, you and I both see streams of income everywhere. Oh, yeah. I mean, squirrel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We really do, but I, I want more people to think like that, to just think, hey, look at this opportunity and just have a, have a go. So people might turn their noses up at, you know, a few hundred pounds or a few hundred dollars a month, but when... 
that comes together with five other things that you're working on. So you get your Mm. £500 from audio and you get your £500 from translations into German and then you get your £500 from one nonfiction or whatever you want. And then it all comes together and you're like, ah, huh, suddenly uh, that's decent money. Yeah, I say this a lot to people. uh, uh, On Kobo now, I'm selling in 61 countries. Yeah, and like one of these countries might not be a lot of money, but when you combine it with the other 60... (laughs) It is. <laughs> well, that's the thing. And I just think, goodness, think forward. You know, this is, you know, what, two years ago I was selling in about 10 countries. And you just think these income streams, yes, they might be a tiny little dribble now. But the more, you know, the more and more and more there are, the more it becomes a, a stream. Yeah. It, it couldn't agree more. That's all I'll <laughs> say. I mean, just you, if you start them now, they will grow or they might fail. Yeah. But then the more you start, the better off you're going to be anyway. There's, there's people who say like niche down and mm. find one thing and focus on it. One, I don't know. I don't think this works very well because one, I'm just distracted by stuff and I'll be bored if I'm just working on one thing all the time. And I do YouTube and I do podcasts and I do different things because if I did one thing, I'd be bored. And then also, yeah, so I don't get to focus on one thing and make that amazing, but that's okay. Yeah, if we wanted that, we'd have a day job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, anyway, one of the things you do is now write books. And so where can people find audiobooks for indies? Uh, I'm going to go select for the first 90 days. Um, so it's going to be exclusively on Amazon. Um, but the best place to find me and find out about that, so if you're listening to this in a few months and just to see what I'm up to, is just to go to Rocking Self Publishing dot com which is the website that hosts the, the podcast and those tutorials and a guest blog and all that other stuff so i'm just head over there and you'll see what i'm up to brilliant thanks so much for your time simon you're welcome joe thank you for having me